who are unable to elect a representative. And that's people not just, obviously you can see the, the Green Party voters would be a very small percentage of those people who elected nobody. Um, it's mainly voters for the larger parties who are unable to elect representation. Which might seem sort of normal um, growing up in a first-past-the-post system, except that that's not how most of our peers work. Um, in one way or another, with proportional representation, most modern democracies make sure that almost everybody's vote counts to elect a representative of their choice. And this is an example, again, you could take almost any area of the country and see something like this, um, of how first past the post fails to represent our diversity. So we all know in the last election, there was a very big strategic voting campaign to get out uh, the Harper Conservatives, but I'm not sure when people went and tried to do that, that this is what they intended. In a 25 out of 25 MPs in the greater Toronto area are from the Liberal Party. Another way to look at this is majority rules. So, you know, a basic definition of democracy is those with the majority get to make the decisions. But unfortunately, the last time 50% of people voted for uh, the governing party in Canada was in 1984. And it's actually very rare. So we've outgrown our electoral system. We actually outgrew it about 100 years ago, but it's become even more pronounced in the last few decades. So just to sum up some of the problems with winner-take-all voting systems, uh, we have the distorted results that you've just seen. Uh, we're on another 39% majority government in Canada. Uh, regional polarization, so when it looks like everybody in Quebec voted for the bloc, or it looks like everybody in Quebec voted for the NDP, when in fact those parties got maybe 40% of the popular vote, but um, everybody else got almost no representation, or it looks like everybody in Alberta votes conservative when they don't. Uh, safe seats, so um, seats where a party could run a lamp post and the lamp post would win, and you can imagine the voter turnout in some of those ridings is not great. Uh, negative strategic voting campaigns, like we saw in the last election. Uh, policy lurch. So this is another thing that we could spend quite a bit of time talking about uh, when one, one government uh, enters us into an international climate agreement, the next government takes us out, then the next government puts us in, and then the next government uh, puts in community mailboxes, and the next government uh, gets rid of that. Back and forth we go. And this kind of um, flip-flop is one of the reasons why countries with proportional representation, where there's more continuity, between governments are incrementally edging ahead of us on so many important issues. Well, in Canada, we make progress, but all that progress can be undone uh, with the next false majority government. And also, uh, first past the post is a barrier to electing women and minorities. And I'm just gonna touch on that a little bit in a minute. So moving on to what is the case for proportional representation? Many of us are very familiar with the problems with first past the post and uh, we are not as familiar. I'm just checking, somebody says they can't hear me. Just wanna make sure everybody can hear me. Jen, can you hear me? Okay, okay. As long as almost everybody can, then I can't really do, do anything about one person that can't. Great. Okay. <laughs> Carrying on. Okay. So one of the uh, reasons, you know, one, so we need to look at some of the reasons why we need to switch to PR. And this is one of the most uh, well-studied topics in political science. This is not some, in the KW record uh, the other day, one of the, the editor who I don't think is a big fan of PR, said that, you know, BC was going to be a laboratory. Well, actually, we've had a laboratory for the last 100 years because most democracies use PR. And as a result, there are decades and decades of research into how PR makes a difference, and that's what we're going to look at. So, again, 80% uh, of our peers use proportional systems. So Canada, the U.S., the U.K. are outliers 
um, and still using first past the post. So the best research on PR was done by a man by the name of Aaron Leiphart, whom I believe was the past vice president of the American Political Science Association. And he didn't just write one book, he spent his entire career, um, and he testified to the ERE committee, looking at exactly this question, what is the difference between what he called majoritarian democracies and what he called consensual democracies, uh, which in effect means to use a winner-take-all system or a proportional system. And he looked at 36 countries over two 25-year periods, and there are about 15 or 16 conclusions um, that he reached through his research in the book. And these are just what you're looking at on the screen, higher voter turnout, um, people happier with the policies that were produced, more women elected, are just a few of the conclusions that he came to because proportional systems outperformed the winner-take-all systems on average on almost every measure he looked at. And a couple of the more important ones uh, would be income inequality. So about three or four researchers now have duplicated this result that the more proportional the system, the lower the income inequality and the more majoritarian the system, the higher the income inequality. And of course, these are correlations, but they're strong correlations and they just repeat. So, you know, one of the theories behind that is that PR uh, allows people, gives people more power to help shape the government and help, um, you know, influence the government to put in policies that reduce inequality and work well for people. And again, environment is another important one where the research is very clear. Numerous researchers have duplicated that countries that use proportional systems on average uh, are doing better on environment. They were quicker to sign on to international agreements. Um, they are better able to control their carbon emissions. They're quicker to switch to renewable energy. And countries with PR elect more women. And this is a rather complicated topic, but it's indisputable that uh, on average, 8% more women are elected in countries with PR. Now, that doesn't mean every country with PR elects more women. It just means on average, when you look over decades at many countries, and that's because with PR, voters have more choice. So instead of just running one person on the ballot in a single member riding, parties must run two, three, or a list. And as soon as that kind of incentive kicks in, then right away people are offered more diverse choice and you'll often, as, as long as the culture of the country is ready for it, you'll often see that reflected in the legislature. So this isn't, this ERRE committee isn't our first go around. Uh, they're not all on here, but we've actually had 14 commission studies or assemblies in Canada. And uh, the first time the Liberal Party of Canada adopted PR as part of their policy uh, was in 1919. So we're heading for the 100th anniversary, actually, of the first all-party committee to study this. So it's something to keep in mind when um, MPs say that this is a new idea that needs more study. And another thing we're hearing quite a lot lately is that there are more important issues than electoral reform. And I, when you look at it from the point of view of mechanics and how many people are really excited about talking about quotas and transfers, of course, there are more important issues than electoral reform. But there really are no more important issues than electoral reform because electoral reform affects decisions on every single major issue that we care about. It, it determines whether a genuine majority is making those decisions. It determines who has a say who has a voice at the table. So in another way, there, there are no more important issues than this one. So I'm gonna look a little bit now very briefly at the voting systems that are used in New Zealand and Ireland. And I'm not going to be talking so much about, um, the guests will, but I'm not gonna be talking so much about specifically how their design of their system works. Um, because it won't be the same in Canada. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, what the system with that name would probably look like in Canada. And they can talk more specifically if they like about how it looks uh, where they are. So the main thing to understand is that there's two main families of voting systems. Uh, so there's the majoritarian family and there's the proportional family. 
And you can see here there's three proportional systems. Uh, there's many more than three proportional systems. I've put this up because those are the three systems that Fair Vote Canada recommended to the all-party committee on electoral reform. So there are MMP, STB, and rural urban. And rural urban is just a blend of MMP and STV that is tailored for our geography. So these same basic concepts have been the same options that have been studied and presented year after year, commission after commission. So there's, there's really nothing terribly new here. So I'll start with single transferable vote, which in Ireland they call PRSTV. So the PR is important because it is a proportional system and it's actually the original proportional system that was invented before there were political parties, if you can imagine such a thing. And so a simple way to understand STV um, is imagine you have five ridings now, for example, Brampton South, Brampton North, Brampton East, you get my point, okay. Each one elects one member right now with first past the post. So one party can win every single one of those single member ridings. With a single transferable vote, you're going to draw a line around those and make it one riding that elects five MPs. Instead of five ridings that elect one, one riding that elects five. And people will elect those MPs using a ranked ballot. And the result is basically that the local MPs um, reflect the diversity of how people in that area voted. So it's like electing a small team of MPs. And this is the system that was recommended by the British Columbia Citizens Assembly in 2005 and went on to get 58% of the vote in their first referendum. And so if you want to look at it on a kind of real map, I stole this from Byron Weber Becker. Thank you, Byron, in Waterloo, who did a lot of testifying for the ERRE. And you can see in my area where I live, Kitchener, Waterloo, right now we have four uh, liberals and a conservative. Before that, we had like five conservatives, uh, flip-flop. Uh, if we had a PRSTV system, we would still have five MPs, but they would be the ones on the right there. They would reflect uh, how people voted in that area. And this would be, in Canada, uh, what a STV ballot would look like. And the one Joanna is going to show you looks different. It's uh, actually pretty neat. It shows the faces of the candidates. It doesn't group them by party like I have here. And those, there's reasons for that, and she's going to talk about that. But in Canada, that's, this is probably what we'd be looking at because it makes it very simple for voters. So you can rank one, two, three, as few or as many uh, as you like. Okay, hey, and now I'm going to talk about MMP, which is probably the PR system that most PR supporters in Canada are more familiar with. So MMP was recommended in 2004 by the Law Commission of Canada. It was an independent group that uh, undertook a two-year study and uh, did a public hearings, not the amount that we've seen with the ERE for sure, but they did quite a few public hearings. They met with stakeholders. They looked at countries around the world. They recommended the mixed member. Mixed member means that you will, about two thirds of the ridings, a little bit less, uh, you will still elect the MP with first past the post or a ranked ballot, doesn't matter. It's a winner take all single member election. Um, but the other MPs will be elected from a regional party list. And this is an open list, which means you'll get to vote for candidates on that party's list. If they don't win enough local seats in an area, they will elect regional MPs from their list until the entire result in that region overall is fair. So I don't really have a Smarties for MMP, but um, again, thanks to Byron, we have a little uh, map here of part of Ontario. And you can see on the left is what we have now, the single member ridings. And on the right, what happens with MMP is each riding gets significantly bigger, uh, about 66% in some of the models. So some ridings will be merged to make bigger single member ridings. And then on the right, you can see that we will also elect regional MPs to make the overall results in that region fair. And this is what an MMP ballot would look like in Canada if this was a regional open list system with fairly small regions. Okay, so smaller than the regions I just showed you on that map. So each region electing maybe about eight MPs, five first past the post, three list. Um, so you would vote first past the post on the top, just like now, and then you would choose one candidate from one party on that regional list you're looking at at the bottom. And that counts as a vote for that person, but more importantly as a vote for that party to determine how many seats in the region they are entitled to. 
So the important thing to remember about these systems, MMP and STV, uh, mixed member proportional single transferable vote, is not the specific mechanics and design, but what they produce. And what they produce are stable cooperative governments. So in Canada, the goal is the gold ring of the single party false majority government. That's what all the parties are striving for and that's what we've been led to believe is the ideal way to govern. It's stable. Um, but in most other countries, our peers, they actually are governed by cooperative arrangements. So you can see majority coalition governments are the most common, um, but almost all the others are also formal agreements between parties. And what this means is that in proportional countries, they're not running back to the polls every year, like you may have heard, their governments last just as long as our governments because the parties have, have these agreements and they have an incentive to work together. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a minute and talk about Ireland. So Ireland uses uh, PRSTV. And right now, Ireland, and I've been working on saying these names, uh, Fine Gael. <laughs> so right now Ireland has some minority government and the interesting thing about that is it's the first minority government they've had since 1989. They usually have majority coalition governments just like I showed you in that last slide. Um, however, they had a rather unusual election in 2016 where they have two main parties and neither of the big parties got enough of the vote to form a majority coalition. So now they have a minority government um, with the support of nine independent MPs and a supply and confidence agreement with the other main party. So interesting how the parties can get creative, eh? Our special guest today, Joanna, was, uh, it's a, was a Labour Party TD, and she was in this coalition government that you see up on the slide there. And so the Labour Party is the, a smaller left-wing party uh, in Ireland, and they were the coalition partner with the larger party, Fine Gael. And you can see they got about uh, they got about 20% of the vote, but instead of being relegated to the opposition for four years, they were part of a coalition government. And as a result of being part of that government, they were able to get 62% of their promises fulfilled, which to me is is kind of amazing. Um, and such a if you can imagine how that would translate in Canada and what a difference that would make in policy. And this is a picture I found from Ireland and uh, Joanna may speak a little bit more about this because it was just fascinating. So about uh, 2002, there was a, it looked like they were headed for a single party majority government with PR, which is possible if one party gets 50% of the vote, they get to govern. And this, instead of saying, yay, that's a good thing, um, the progressive Democrats ran a campaign saying one party government, no thanks. They said that's unaccountable and partnership works. And voters responded to that message and they did not elect a single party majority government. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about New Zealand, last couple slides here. So New Zealand right now has a minority government that has a confidence and supply agreement with three other parties. So unlike most PR democracies where they are majority coalitions, since New Zealand switched to MNP from first past the post in 1996, Minority governments with uh, formal agreements have been the norm in New Zealand. They have not gone the coalition route. Um, so yeah, so they have eight parties. So that's another thing I wanted to point out. Both of these countries that we're talking about have eight parties. So when we say that PR may lead, moderate PR may lead to a small increase in the number of parties, that's what you're seeing here. So in 2011, to remind you in Canada, we had six parties sitting in the legislature and a couple of independents. So Ireland and New Zealand have eight. It's not a huge explosion of parties. And the right wing, the national party in New Zealand who is the government, and they're coming up on another election, um, is a center right, right party. So, and they have served three terms now. So if anybody says that PR um, can't work for the right, uh, that's, that's not true. It just reflects back what voters are saying. And here's my picture for you from New Zealand. You may have seen this before. A friend of mine on the board who now lives in New Zealand sent this to me. This is a bus stop advertisement in their last election. And it says, your vote is worth exactly the same as mine. 
and that's a powerful thing. And that is exactly what we're trying to get to here in Canada, a lot closer to the idea that every voter really counts, no matter what area of the country you live in or what party you vote for. Okay. All right, so now what I'd like to do is I'm going to bring on Joanna, um, who can tell you about herself and a little bit more about the experience with single transferable vote in Ireland. Joanna. Hi, um, Anita. So I, I suppose I'm, I'm going to start just by giving a bit of background about our system, how we got, how we got it. Okay. So um, basically we have the uh, PRSTV electoral system since we gained our independence in 1922. So when we were part of um, the United Kingdom, basically we used to have we had the same system as as they have there, which is uh, basically the first past the post system. Okay, so it was one person was elected per constituency and so on. So um, when we gained our independence, we we bought you know right from the outset. Um, we are by the single transferable system was the electoral system we used. Okay, so. Um, it's enshrined in our constitution, which is basically the, our, our present constitution was adopted in 1937. That's a, that's a hard copy of it there. And um, basically in that constitution, it actually enshrines PRSTV. So if we wanted to move away from, if we wanted to replace our electoral system with a different one, we would actually have to amend our constitution. Okay. So there's been two attempts to change our political, our, our electoral system. Um, both were basically driven by the big party at the time, which was Fianna Fáil. And at the time, Fianna Fáil didn't even had a majority uh, in government, but uh, it wanted to bring in the um, basically the first past the post system. So there was referendums held in 1958 and in 1959, and in both cases, at both times, that referendum was you know that proposed amendment was defeated by the people because the people voted against moving away from PRS TV and there would have been a lot of discussion and um and in fact in I can't remember which which one now but in one of them there was actually a general election on the same day and while Fianna Fáil won the majority they lost the referendum so they were proposing replacing our electoral system and I just I don't know if you're about to see here but a picture of a poster at the time which was Done, put up by the Labour Party at the time. Okay, so warning: the straight vote is corrupted. Vote no. So uh, the, the Labour Party at the time would have been a small party as it is now, and it would have campaigned against uh, replacing our electoral system. So um, just to say as well, in the Constitution, um, what it says in Article 16, uh, 2, 5 of the Constitution, it says that. The members of Dáil Éireann shall be elected on the system of proportional representation by means of the single transferable vote. Um, and it says in the next uh, subsection, Article 16, that no law shall be enacted whereby the number of members returned by any constituency shall be less than three. So, um, so like that's it. It's very much, it's, you know, I mean, our constitution is, is a short enough document. It's very much in broad strokes really sets it out very clearly what our electoral system is. Um, now, there was a lot of, like, when, uh, you know, I mean, over the years, there's been mutterings by some people about our electoral system. And, like, when we had our financial crisis, which started around 2008, um, there was a lot of debate, you know, in public discourse and in the media and so on, that the cause was our electoral system, our political system and so on. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, there's uh, certainly some people were blaming our electoral system, right? Despite the fact that, you know, in any service that's been done, very much the public is behind PRS TV. But anyway, one of the outcomes of the general election in 2011 was um, there was a, a const our constitutional convention set up to look at various matters to do with our constitution. And one of those matters was look at whether our electoral system should be changed okay so um i mean that wouldn't have come so much from the labor party the labor party would have proposed there be a constitutional convention okay? 
Ireland, because that would have been in our manifesto in the 2011 general election. The Gael has always had, you know, a fair amount of voices where they would have wanted to change their electoral system. Not, not all of them, but some of their people, some of their spokespeople. And again, I would feel that comes from them being the bigger party, because I always feel change to single seat constituency favour a bigger party. But anyway, it was looked at um, by the Constitutional Convention. So the Constitutional Convention was made up of um, 100, 100 people, and uh, that included uh, um, Oireachtas members, but it was largely made up of citizens who were picked you know, to represent, um, you know, give a broad representation of our demographic and to be representative. So anyway, in, June, in 2013, the Constitutional Convention met over two months, so two full weekends, uh, one in May and one in June 2013. And um, at the first one, the first meeting, three systems were examined um, as an alternative to PRSTV. And they were list systems, non-proportional systems, such as the system there is in the United Kingdom, and mixed member proportional systems. So at the end of that weekend in May, there was a vote by the delegates um, as to which systems to look closer at. And what they decided was they would look closer at, um, the one they favoured looking closer at was MMP, so the Mixed uh, Member Proportional System, and then also to look at um, PRSTV in terms of how it could be modified, okay? So, um, so the second meeting was in June, and it did that. It, it looked in great detail. But in both meetings, it was, we had a great amount of, in terms of there was various prevent presentations about things like different types of list systems and so on. But uh, at the second meeting, anyway, when we looked closer at MMP, MMP, and we looked at issues around your STV, such as the size of constituency, our ballot paper, and so on. Um, a ballot was held, and that ballot was decisively in favour of keeping your STV, but in modified form. Okay, so um, uh, just in relation to that, like the modified form was basically, I, I just, I'm just going to quote here from the chair, Tom Arnold. Just mentioned when it finished its, its deliberations had to report to the government and to the and to the Oireachtas, okay? So it had, it's basically the fourth report of the Constitutional Convention uh, was on the issue of the electoral system. So in the introduction to that, uh, the Chair Tom, Tom Arnold basically says that at the conclusion of the plenary meeting in June, the result of the ballot was decisively in favour of keeping the current TV electoral system but in modified form, in particular by increasing the size of constituents changing from the alphabetical order of candidates on the ballot paper. Okay. So that's that's where we're at now. So like, I mean, you, you know, I don't, there hasn't been any, certainly there hasn't been as much, I think that put the whole issue to bed in Ireland by changing our electoral system, at least for the time being anyway. So, um, so just to conclude, I had uh, the ballot, like just to say that the um, PRS TV is used in all of our electoral systems all of our elections. So in our local elections um, and our presidential election, it's also used, okay? So this is just, um, that was the right way up. Yeah. Um, this is a sample ballot paper. It's from the Department of Environment and Local Government website. So if you go online and look up, uh, just Google in sample ballot paper from 2016 general election, we'll come to this hopefully. And I've just printed it out. So basically, the, the names of ballots, it's only in recent years or recent elections, before it was introduced that we have photos of candidates. But before that, it would have been the name and the address of the candidate and you know, set out in alphabetical order. Um, now, personally, I'd favor keeping alphabetical order because I feel that um, when people go into a ballot box, easy for them then to find their candidate because we all understand things are put in alphabetical order so i think if you mixed it up it was random which is the kind of way thing that uh the convention was looking at i don't think that would work so well to be honest because i think our voters were so well trained in the system as it stands i think it would be a mistake maybe to change the ordering 
ballot paper, but that was one of the proposals of the Constitutional Convention. Um, as was said there, um, the one party government, no thanks, that Anita referred to, um, in a way that comes, that's come up in a lot of elections uh, you know, in the past couple of decades. They, they did it, but we've used that, the Labour Party would have used that uh, in its election in 2011. So the second last week there was polls published with, which, made, which suggested that Fine Gael could get an overall majority. So we would have put a similar message, not quite that message, but we would have put a similar message out and to the time, very much, what, you know, saying, I suppose, to that fear of people that, you know, one party in government is not a good idea. So it's, while we used to have a majority in recent, like for, since I, I suppose a certain period, we haven't had, we've always had coalitions in a certain period. And I can't remember exactly when, but uh, go back to at least the, say, 1980s, that, that things started to creep in where people wanted to have more than one party in government. They, they don't, I think in general, um, people don't want when they vote for governments to be too fragmented. Although I think in the last election, there was, I think there was an answer where people, certainly when I came to people, they wanted to change the government, but they didn't really know what they wanted instead. I think that's why we have the minority government we have. Um, I'm not so sure I agree with there being a minority government, because I think minority government um, doesn't have a proper mandate. And the way it's working out at the moment is the least amount of legislation uh, ever passed by the current current government so far uh, during a government term. So I think that how much where the government is because it's a minority, minority government, um, they're afraid to, to do a lot of things they might otherwise do if they had a majority. But, I mean, our system has, as Anita said, had majority governments where there's only one party, but it's also had majority governments where there's coalitions. In 2011, 2016, there was a very strong majority by um, Miguel and Labour, it was made up of over 100 uh, TDs out of 166. Okay. So, um, just to say as well, I suppose one point, because I would have argued, I've always argued very much in favour of keeping PS TV, and absolutely I, that's what I, where I stand today. Um, but I would have made the point at the Constitutional Convention and elsewhere that when, we, when Ireland brought in the um, uh, PRS TV, when it, it, it took it on board in 1922, at that time, that was the progressive idea about electoral um, systems. So we were, we were a blank slate uh, when we set up our parliament and we chose PRS TV. And I believe it was chosen because it was progressive and we wanted to move away from the United Kingdom system, okay? And um, I would say as well that I would feel that personally that it's um, sorry, it's um, not necessarily as proportional, say, as a list system or a pure list system. And I suppose some people might argue that MMP can be more proportional. But I think that the voters um, in using PRS TV make it roughly proportional. Okay, and um, I think that's I think when the citizens assembly or when the Citizens' Convention or the Constitutional Convention looked at this, it, um, it took on board that if we had the constituencies from five upwards, that, that would make it more proportional. And that's what the Convention voted for. Okay, They took on board that, that argument that five or more seats, the constituencies with five or more seats were needed to make it more proportional. Where at the moment, we do have three seats and we have four seaters. Um, and like the argument is that, that if we meant our constitution make it um, you know that it had to be at least five seats that we would have even more proportional elections but there's also been a lot of research for example professor michael gallagher did a paper um called the discreet arm of prs tv he pointed out that the, the electorate when they go out and vote tend to make even in three seaters outcome to be proportional okay as proportional as they can. So they are themselves aware when they vote, it seems that they need to not let one party have too many seats. So I think I think that's where well, I've covered a lot of ground there. And actually, just as well, I suppose it'll probably come up later, but 
relation, we, when we looked at the mixed member system, um, what I think swayed people against that at the centre was they didn't like the idea of lists, list to list system, uh, and list systems would be part. So with you know in a mixed member system with a list system, um, if you have a list system at all, you have a threshold, and then um, that means that a party below that threshold would lose out. Whereas in our system of PRSTV, smaller parties, you know, you can be very small or independent and you can get elected. Okay? And um, the other thing is, I remember at the time, I, re I read around the time when we were looking at, change, you know, when there was a debate in Ireland about our electoral system, I remember looking up um, about, uh, you know, what arguments there were against mixed member systems. And for example, in, what, in Wales, there has been a couple of commissions and reports which have recommended moving away from MMP to the um, RSTV. And one, when voters were surveyed in Wales, they looked at the list system seats as kind of compensation seats. And they looked at the, re as, uh, the people elected from constituencies as the real um, parliamentary, you know, real parliamentary representatives. Certainly when we looked at it at the Constitutional Convention, that was push, you know, it was told to us that in other countries that a lot of people who are elected on the list want to be elected from the constituency. So they do a lot of constituency work. So the idea that, you know, if you have a mixed member system, it would have a balance between some people who do constituency work and who won't. That, that's not considered the outcome in practice in terms of how the, the members of parliament act. Okay. And, um, to say as well about our own system, there's been a lot, you know, a lot of criticism that it makes us do more constituency work. Although I know that there have been studies that found, for example, that Canadian MPs the most work, but even in areas where there's less systems, an awful lot of constituency work. And you know, when you really average it all out, it's probably not that dissimilar between different countries. I hope that gives you some background. That's great, Joanna. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to turn my webcam back on. All right, Steve. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> turn on your webcam. I will. Thank you. There. Oh, look, it works. Okay. And I'm going to turn off mine while you talk. And then, All right, don't forget you. to introduce yourself again in case people have forgotten who you are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, I'm Steve Withers, and I guess my main um, claim to fame uh, is that uh, I, I emigrated to New Zealand un, sort of somewhat unwittingly in 1982. And um, uh, along the way, I, I got involved in about 1988, I got involved in the Electoral Reform Coalition campaign uh, for proportional representation in New Zealand. Um, and I went to my first meeting, and at the end of it, I ended. I was on the national executive. So, okay. So I did that, and uh, we basically worked day and night for a bunch of years, uh, and got some referendums through a series of fortuitous events, uh, and uh, we ended up with uh, MMP. Now, uh, why did it change? Uh, when I arrived in 1982, the prime minister at the time, Sir Robert Muldoon. Uh, was a virtual dictator. Uh, the Parliament of New Zealand was 99 seats. Uh, he had a one-seat majority, so he had about 50 seats, um, and about 25 of those people were in his cabinet. So there was absolutely no possibility that the backbench of the National Party government would hold the executive to account. And because all patronage came from the Prime Minister, who was also the Finance Minister, um, there was really um, no opportunity to challenge or do anything. It was whatever Robert Muldoon wanted was, was what happened. Um, people were pretty unhappy about that. And that helped fuel the desire for uh, a change. Now, the other thing about New Zealand's political system is there is no upper chamber. It is purely the parliament and parliament's power is absolute. Uh, and I mean the House of Commons, except, I mean, there's no distinction because it's only the one chamber. Uh, so there, that made uh, Robert Muldoon a virtual dictator. He could, uh, he could, uh, as he did, he could uh, freeze prices. He could uh, tell the banks what their interest rates on loans were going to be tomorrow. 
Um, he could change the reserve requirements overnight because uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, after the oil shocks, he started using a, a, a wartime uh, economic measures act to deal with the fallout from the economic shocks as a result of the rapidly rising price of oil and the high rates of inflation. So he was basically ruling New Zealand for several years um, by fiat, uh, or just orders from the prime minister. Um, and a lot of people were very unhappy. So that, that really helped the push for um, electoral reform. Um, there had been a, uh, there was a royal commission at one stage into the electoral system after uh, Muldoon was defeated in 1984. And that was put up by Sir Geoffrey Palmer, who was minister of justice at the time, I believe. And he had a royal commission around the voting system. And he had as a academic written a book uh, called uh, Unbridled Power, uh, documenting how New Zealand's system was open to abuse by the executive and how there was uh, really no accountability other than via elections. And election results um, didn't reflect what people voted for. In 1978 and 1981, the Labour Party actually got more votes than the National Party, but because of the way the local seats were drawn, the boundaries, uh, the National Party would end up with more seats because the rural seats uh, were slightly favored over the urban seats. So Labour would win massive majorities in the cities and National would win the government in the countryside. Uh, people got tired of that and uh, it was an election issue in 1990 and the, the government, uh, both party, major parties promised a referendum on MMP or on changing the voting system. Um, and uh, the National Party won um, in 1990. Uh, and they went ahead and had uh, a referendum in 92 on just was simply asking, do you want to change the voting system? Uh, and the second question was, if you, whether or not you wanted to change it or not, which of these other systems would you consider acceptable? So um, the outcome there was that 70% or no, I think it was 86% wanted to change the voting system and uh, that 70% favored MMP. All right, so in 1993, they went to a uh, referendum at the general election because New Zealand has a three-year term and part of the reason they have a three-year term is to deal with this lack of accountability. If we, um, if we can't hold them to account, at least we can kick them out more frequently. So um, the three-year term is very popular. Anyway, in 1993, they had the referendum and MMP uh, got through with about 53% of the vote because the threshold was 50%. And uh, MMP was introduced at the 1996 elections. Um, that uh, I won't go blow by blow through a series of elections, but there was a fairly instant change. Uh, there were, in fact, in the interregnum, the period between 93 and 96, parties began to uh, jockey for position in advance of the 96 proportional election. And there were several new parties formed. Uh, one chunk of National Party broke away. Uh, and uh, tried to stand on its own. They didn't get anywhere, but um, uh, but that's the sort of thing that was going on. So even though New Zealand didn't have MMP yet, uh, they started having a multi-party uh, parliament uh, in advance of it because people were trying to stake out their political ground. So that was an interesting little period. Um, but ultimately, uh, we had uh, the first election of M MMP and, and um, uh, there was a multi-party multi -party outcome. The Greens were elected with their 5% threshold. New Zealand First got something like 13%. Um, you might call them the Donald Trump party if you wanted. Um, they're similar sort of anti-immigrant, um, quasi-racist sort of approach to things in, in, in the sense that they're New Zealand First. Uh, UKIP they would uh, identify many of the, um, the UK Independence Party would identify uh, with many of the values there. They're not necessarily negative. It's more about how you express them. Um, and uh, and they, they became, um, they actually went into, it took quite a long time to decide, and they went into a coalition with a national party, uh, which was kind of unfortunate for them because two thirds of the New Zealand part and New Zealand first voters had actually been labor voters who had gone over to vote for them. Um, so instantly New Zealand first uh, support went from 13% to 4% in the polls and stayed there for quite a long time. And at the next election, the only reason they stayed in was because Winston Peters won his electoral seat. Now, that introduces the idea of how does New Zealand's MMP work? There are 120 seats formally, although there's frequently an overhang. 
uh, with, uh, and currently there's 121. Um, 120 seats. Initially, 60% were local. 60 seats were local, and 60 were list. Uh, and uh, but as time has gone on, more local seats have been allocated, and they have come out of the list seats. So now it's closer to 70 50. Um, I don't know the exact numbers. I tried to find them out, and uh, the only way to do that would have been to actually sit there and count the list of electorates. And I was busy painting my house, so I didn't have time. Um, but the the idea there is that uh, of the 120 seats, uh, the threshold is you either get 5% to get elected uh, or you win one local seat. And if you win one local seat, you're entitled to your party's percentage of the share of the vote, even if it's not 5%. So that's uh, proven to be an unpopular feature of New Zealand's MMP system. Um, and also, uh, just just to uh, highlight, I know, I know a lot of the MMP systems proposed for Canada are provincially or regionally based. Uh, New Zealand went with a regional, uh, with a sorry, with a full national list because uh, there are no provinces here, there are no subdivisions. It's a unitary government. There's one legislature for the entire country. Um, there'd be no basis to create subdivisions that would be um, recognized. Um, so um, it's a full national list and your party vote applies to the entire list, uh, not just a small subset of it in your local region. And that does help uh, uh, produce a fairly high level of proportionality, uh, which is a good thing. Now, anyway, uh, we've been through a series of uh, MMP elections. There was the usual, I shouldn't say usual, because many of you would be unfamiliar with it. Um, there were good actors and bad actors. There are good people and people who probably shouldn't have been in Parliament, but they thought it was a great idea at the time. And uh, the forces in the media and elsewhere who didn't like MMP would make a big deal out of um, uh, the odd MP who would um, get very upset and then go away and forget to return all their electorate equipment and uh, things like that. So there were some people there who probably shouldn't have been in politics, but they were in the smaller parties and the smaller parties at that time hadn't really got used to actually electing people and their candidate selection procedures initially left uh, a little bit to be desired. Uh, they learned from that uh, because it hurt them uh, and uh, things have steadied out quite nicely. But the, um, uh, the, the problem there was uh, people were actually interesting because there were always problems under first past the post. There were MPs who were convicted of crimes and and uh, I think one who actually went to jail for a while and all, but people tend to forget all that. And uh, because there was uh, somebody under MMP who was investigated for something or other, they go, oh, MMP is a terrible money system. So a lot of that kind of dishonest misrepresentation going on. And, and with MMP, um, what happened was there was a faction in the Conservative Party, as it seems to always be the Conservatives who do this, who, who said, oh, we were promised a, a review referendum. And of course, no promise was ever made of that. That, that uh, was simply wasn't true. But um, there were people who were around who were quite happy to um, say, you know, that, oh, that we really need a chance to review it. Um, and eventually the National Party became the government again uh, in 2008. And one of their election policies was um, to have a referendum on MMP, uh, which they did. And uh, part of that uh, was that was in 2011. And we actually did have it. Uh, fortunately, it was long enough after MMP had been uh, introduced that there were a, a huge number of new voters in the intervening um, 15 odd years who had never voted under any other system. Uh, and that helped actually increase the support for MMP to just under 58%, uh, which noted, I mean, if there'd been a 60% 60, 60 threshold like in many of the Canadian referendums, uh, MMP wouldn't have been chosen in New Zealand on either occasion. Um, but it was a clear majority, 50, 57 points up, very high percentage of 57.9 or something. So it was 58%. So support for MMP actually increased. Um, now, uh, the, the big, the, the, one of the things that's interesting too is New Zealand also uses STV for some of the local body elections in the Kapiti District Council, Wellington City Council. Um, I think Dunedin City Council on the South Island uh, also is elected via STV. And also the district health boards uh, around the country are also elected and they're elected via STV. So, um, so we're, we're, 
becoming uh, more familiar uh, with STV here as well, and it's always been a popular alternative to them. So, uh, yeah. Now, um, with MMP, though, uh, one of the, the things that happened after the referendum uh, in 2011 was that there was a royal commission um, looking at uh, what might change about MMP, given that people had voted to keep it. Uh, and they, one of the things that came through most loud and clear was uh, to get rid of the single seat rule. And that was if you, as I've already mentioned, if you won a single seat, your party was entitled to um, its share of the vote, whether or not you made the 5%. Well, one of the reasons this little thing is, in, is unpopular is that um, the National Party in particular has been using it to try and uh, gain coalition partners. Um, they do get the largest share of the vote by themselves, and that's a problem because it's not a majority. And they don't really have any partners. Um, although 45% might vote national, the other 55% vote for everybody else. And, and of the everybody else, most of them wouldn't want to have anything to do with national. So that was a problem for them. So uh, what they've done is stood aside in local electorates like Ohario, Belmont, uh, and Epsom in Auckland, and allowed another party um, Conservative Party, with a nod and a wink to the voters, you know, to, uh, oh, by the way, uh, vote for these guys if you support a national government. So that's where David Seymour of the ACT Party and Peter Dunn of the United Future Party uh, have been able to retain their seats. Um, and in fact, the ACT Party has held Epsom for probably 10 or 15 years purely on that basis, that it's a proxy vote for national. And the idea was that um, they would give, uh, they, all they'd have to do is win the one seat and National might get two or three or four other bonus MPs off the share of the vote from around the country. Now, um, voters don't really like it. So what's happened is uh, ACT has one seat in Epsom and United Future has one seat in uh, Ohio, Belmont, and neither party gets enough votes on the party list to give them even one more MP. So in effect, uh, voters themselves have negated uh, the effect of that and that all, all it really means is National gives up a local MP. Now, that's an interesting thing because all, their share of the vote is the same. So if they get 45% of the vote, they get 45% of all the MPs, and losing a local seat doesn't mean a thing because they just get one more list seat. Um, so, that, 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 so in effect, at the end of the day, when you add them all up in terms of who is the government, who isn't, um, they do have an additional seat because uh, the ACT Party will support National, because uh, if they don't, they won't, they, National won't stand aside in the next election. Uh, and the same again for Peter Dunn. He has to be a little careful because the only reason he's in there is because National stands aside. And if he annoys them, uh, there's a chance they may decide not to and seriously campaign against him. Uh, and uh, that would hurt him. So the, both of those minor parties are aware of that risk. Now, the other minor party who is uh, supporting the National Party minority government presently is the Maori Party. And the Maori Party, um, the other thing that I didn't mention about New Zealand's composition is that among the local seats, seven of the local seats are purely Maori seats. And to, to vote in them, you have to be on the Maori electorate. Uh, and initially, that was created back in 1855. Um, to uh, contain that half of the New Zealand population that was Maori and give them four seats, and while all the white folks got 50 or 60. So it, initially it was uh, a way to contain the Maori vote and stop them from being properly represented. Uh, and then as the population changes uh, occurred over the years, um, the Maori came to regard those seats as being their guaranteed entry in parliament because uh, they really didn't have any chance of winning in most of the local seats. So. It changed around. When MMP was introduced, there were seven Maori seats, upgraded from four. Um, now, what happens now is the Maori Party broke away with the Labour Party uh, 10 years ago over um, customary rights around uh, the foreshore and seabed. They saw it as yet another colonial uh, property confiscation uh, in the 21st century, uh, where they, had, they saw themselves as having customary rights around harvesting seafood. Uh, and fishing off the coast, um, which were being allocated by the government to commercial interests and Maori interests weren't being recognized, uh, they felt. And so they, uh, a bunch of labor MPs, well, one in particular, Tariana Turia, uh, walked away from the labor party. She had been a minister 
uh, and founded the Maori Party along with some other people. And initially they did very well. They won, I think, um, five of the seven Maori seats initially. Uh, and um, they uh, were strong critics of labor. Now, when National came in, uh, the Maori Party had an ax to grind with labor, and so they supported National and have continued to support National. Um, now, their hopes and aspirations haven't been fully realized with respect to some of the foreshore and seabed stuff, and so their support has fallen away, but they still win either two or three of the local seats. Uh, and that is the reason for the current overhang and the last several is that although their share of the vote is only 1.5% or 1% or 2%, depending on the election, uh, they do win uh, three, four or five seats. Uh, and so the parliament ends up being bigger than 120. Um, and uh, it's interesting too, that the people who don't vote, the people vote for them locally and elect the local MPs, but on the list, they actually give their votes to labor uh, like they used to. So uh, that that is the tendency. Although more and more of them are voting for the Green Party, apparently. So anyway, so that is uh, now the the last thing I'll talk about just briefly is the list versus versus local MPs because that is a, a big deal. And I I, I heard uh, Joanna talking about how people saw their local MP in Ireland as being their real MP. Uh, my personal experience of local MPs in New Zealand is that they're a complete waste of space. They're the essence and heart of the party act clique. Uh, and the list MPs are the ones who actually do any real work and who are really have to work to represent people because if they don't, they can easily be bumped off the list, whereas it can be quite difficult to displace a sitting local MP. And in my electorates in, in New Zealand, uh, the local MP for the last several years, depending which electorate I live in, has uniformly been a National Party Conservative MP who makes it absolutely clear when I write a letter, they have no interest in anything I have to say. So when I, when I go to vote, I'm very tempted to just simply not do the local vote at all, because for me, it's a complete meaningless waste of time. And the only vote that I have that's worth anything at all is my party vote. And for that reason, in my experiences over the last 20 years with MMP, is I'd be completely happy to go completely party list only and get rid of these wasters and arrogant people in the local seats. Thanks, Steve. Can I, can I finish on that? Yeah. I think that's a good spot to finish. All right. So what I, I'm sure you guys have heard, everyone here has heard some pretty interesting things, eh? Uh, so we're going to go over to the questions. So I'm just going to pop out my little question panel here. Um, okay. One thing I wanted to ask, though, that uh, maybe actually Steve sort of touched on it about the choices that voters have with MMP and the local seats versus the importance of the list seats. I wanted to also hear from Joanna. Um, one of the things we hear in Canada about STV is it's, quote, the most complicated system in the world and the MPs elected with first past the post will say you need a degree, you need a degree in some kind of math to understand it and that it's too complicated. So may, actually, maybe both of you could address that. Are either of your PR systems too complicated for voters, or do voters understand how to use them when they go to the ballot box? No, you see, I think because we've had it since the um, foundation of our state, um, in general, voters are very much educated in it. And then it's probably reflected then in other areas of life. Like we have a college admission system. It's not unlike your STV in terms of put your, you, you know, the course you want most first and the one you want second, second and so on. And then when it's all computed, you know, it works out uh, proportionately and all of that kind of stuff. So like, um, you know, what I found is that, because we've obviously got a lot much, you know, in recent, and certainly in the last decade, we have more people living in Ireland who, who were born in other countries, who come from other countries. Um, you know, uh, say for example, my own constituency, there would be a lot of people from India, Pakistan, and so on. Now, I found for people who are from other communities who have come here in adult life, they find our system hard to adjust to initially. Um, but at the same time, like, it's not really that complicated, you know? That, I mean, that basically, that is, if I was explaining it to somebody and saying, well, you know, you put the person, you give your number one to the person you want most, give your number two to the person you want second most, you give your number three to the person you want third most, 
and so on. And then, you know, it'll all come out in the mix. And, you know, like, this, I think as well, just to make the point as well, I think the system in itself makes voters quite sophisticated. And I think the other, the other side of it is, like, we're all voters. Like, you know, the voters are the same as Steve. You know, we're all voters. We're all equal. We have different points of view. And when, when you have a system like our own, which is PRS TV and multi seat constituency, um, it throws up, you know, a, rough, a roughly proportionate result in every sense of the word. So, for example, Michael D. Higgins is our president. He's a, he is a most, you know, he's an intellectual. That's what people would consider him to be. Um, he was an academic. He was at one, at one stage in the Shannad, but he was also a TD. TD is a chap the doll, a representative uh, to the doll from the constituency. So, like. We've had uh, John Kelly, who's a professor, a legal professor. He, you know, he's considered the uh, absolute. Uh, you know, he's the he was the expert. He's passed away now, but he was the expert on the Irish Constitution. Um, he was a TD at one stage. You know what I, You know what I mean? Like so, like the voters vote, and the other thing is what surveys have found in Ireland um, is that the voters vote both party and person. So when they go vote a uh, vote. Like, if they want Fianna Gael, that will be the outcome. Um, if they want Fianna Gael to be the majority or to be in, you know, the main party, that will be the, you know, if the majority of voters want that, that will be the outcome. So they both vote, on the one hand, for the person and the, uh, you know, there could be local issues, but at the same time, they're also going into the ballot box wanting a particular government. So they do all of those things when they cast their vote, okay? Um, so, like, I just, I feel that... Um, and I suppose the other point, just as well, PRS TV in, in multi seat constituencies is not a million miles away from um, a list system. Okay, when when you if you if you certainly what was presented to us by political scientists um, at our constitutional convention, and what I've learned from experience, because when I was a TD, I would have gone and met you know members of parliament from other countries, like for example Finland. Right in Finland, they didn't meet on a Monday because they to do their constituency work. These were people who were elected on lists. You know I mean, if you had a closed list, like in Israel, you know, you might you have that total removed from local life and daily matters and all of that kind of stuff. But like, I think when, even when it comes to a list system, um, if it's an open list system, people will revert to the fact that they're, you know, there are human beings voting for other human beings, you know, and, and you know, they live in a locality and it's how that, issue a national issue affects them and their locality so i definitely would disagree with steve on that point um and i think you see our system probably deals with that because all types of people are elected to our parliament from and i mean Nye bevan was elected in britain he was i always put point this out to people when people say we should have experts in parliament he established the british health service then the national health service he left school at 13 and was a minor he had an idea about you know a national public health system that would be free so, like, you know, um, you don't have to be obviously, have, you know, you don't have to have qualifications, obviously, to be a very good representative, you know, or a minister. But, like, I think PRS TV will produce, you know, lots of different types of members of parliament. That's my view, and that's my, I think that's our experience in Ireland. Thanks. Steve, did you have a comment on whether voters understand MMP? Like, do they understand that the party vote is the one that's the most important vote. Do they oh, vote I, differently yeah. on both sides that's of the ballot, the, like you? What, what what people understand is individually tailored, I believe. Um, I when you when you I mean, by that I, that's just a funny way of saying some people get it and some people don't like anything. Um, it it couldn't be more simple. I mean, STV is simple. Uh, you rank the people in order of preference, and and when we vote district health board. Uh, there's 35 people there on the ballot, and I got to elect seven of them. So I do my ballot first, and the rest of the the family copies it. Not because they can't count the 35, but because they've got no idea who these people are, and so they they have to sit there. And I'm the guy who spends three hours reading the guff, trying to figure out what the values of the individual people are, and then rank the ballot for the other three people in my family, so they know what they know what to do. And that, I guess that to me that's a weakness. It's not the actual voting that's the problem. It's who the heck do you vote for. And, and that, that's the real issue, and it presumes a lot of uh, familiarity with your local people that actually these days when we all watch sports on TV, 
you don't even know who your neighbors are. You know, so so give, trying to figure out who to vote for is actually probably a bit of a struggle. But to me, that's the biggest struggle with STV when you get a lot of people on the ballot. Now, the but MMP, it's simpler in that regard. Uh, there's a list of parties on the one side and a list of people on the other for the local electorate. You pick the one party you want, you pick the one person you want, and it's basically first past the post. And the way those first past the post votes get allocated it's presidential style, first past the politics, first past the post politics, just like in Canada now. Oh, I like, you know, I like Justin, I'll vote for that guy. And, or I like, uh, you know, I like uh, Stephen Harper, I'll vote for, their, I'll vote for her. Um, and it, that very much happens in the, in the local seats because it still is just first past the post like it always was. And all that, all that happens is the list seats and the party vote um, add a bit of reality to what people really do want in terms of the values. And I would make that distinction in terms of when you vote, the party vote is about your values. It's not about the people. It's about what kind of country do I want? What kind of policies do I want? And in that sense, the parties are brands that represent different quantums of, uh, of, of values and priorities to, to individual issues like health and education or neoliberal economics versus some more socialist kind of an orientation. So, so your, your, party let, your party vote lets you gloss over all the individual permutations that people might have. And, and vote for the values you support. And I think, to me, um, I get maybe I deal in meta and abstraction more easily than a lot of people. I, I don't actually care if I'm voting for Dave, Joe, or Mary. I just want to know that Dave, Joe, or Mary are going to execute the values that I support. And, uh, and the parties themselves do go to some considerable lengths to make sure that the candidates do represent geographically, uh, gender-based, and, uh, and also to, in, in, in other ways, uh, ethnic. Uh, Mix as well. So I mean, uh, just so, but can people vote? Uh, is it easy to vote? Yeah, one party, one person. And I do know people, and they're very nice people. And I, I do know people who were member <laughs> of a party that I was a member of, who went, yes, I went and voted for Daisy in the local, but I gave my party vote to somebody else. And they're like, and people were just, why would you do that? <laughs> It's so bizarre to think that the electorate secretary in a party would actually completely fail to understand uh, the priority between the two votes. But um, but there are, I mean, that's what I say, people will do any darn thing. And uh, But in, it, they make it as easy as possible. Now, for, in STV's defense, voting is easy. The counting's the hard bit, but we don't have to count. So somebody else, there are boffins and experts who do all the counting. We don't need to worry about that. So STV, voting is easy enough. Just the only thing I've ever found a struggle was who to vote for. Okay, that's great. And just to point out when Steve is saying, you know, that he researches 35 people, you don't need to do that with STV if there's, I, um, you all saw the sample ballot, right? So um, the research in Ireland shows the average person ranks four people. Because really, if the say you're, an NDP voter and the Conservatives are running three candidates, do you really care who they are? You can care who they are and rank them if you want, but um, the ones that really care a lot, like Steve, will sit there and they'll go through every person and they'll fill out their complete ballot, which is great. And some oh, people I will just add, rank one or two people. That's it. Can I, can I just say the, the district okay. health board stuff, they're, they're not party-based. It is 35 right. individuals. And, right. and, and there, there might be a quarter of them who are broadly on a, on a ticket that's informal. So that, I mean, it, it, it is the most difficult uh, version, I suppose, in the sense that it's not party based. But it, that does actually touch back on how important the parties are in terms of getting people to vote. And, and what you've just said, Anita, is there, you don't have to worry about who all the people are as long as you know what party they're in. Oh, bingo. Right. So it's it's a balance. And I think Joanna would say that too. So it's a balance between a system that is like 100% party, like Israel, and a system that is the most candidate system ever, centered system ever, like STV, and then something in the middle, which is like MMP with an open list, right? So it's all just balancing. Just one point, I suppose, there, Anita, is that, you know, clear during our constitutional convention that when people were talking about MMP in the, at the convention, they, uh, many of the people thought it would involve multi-seats. 
you know, that the constituency elected representatives would be elected from multi seats. What one of the things I used to think about that at the time, because I'm not aware of any country that has that type of system. Anywhere you have MMP, it's one person elected from a constituency, and then the others are elected either from a local or a national list, as, as is in the case of New Zealand. And I was just wondering, I don't really see. Well, I suppose it's slightly different because what you have is if, 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 if say, New Zealand introduced a multi seat in the constituencies, it would have basically two lists. It would have a local list and a national list. Okay, so I suppose you could argue, you know, for that reason. And I suppose because you haven't got an upper house, maybe, you know, it would be a view that that's a good thing, you know. But at the same time, like, if I would feel, why would you need um, MMP if you have multi seat? That, that, that would be my view. I feel that if you have under PSTV and constituency, it elects both types of people, you know, and they all have an equal mandate, and there's no, well, that type of MP is better, or that person has more of a mandate, which is often what the public tends to think. Right? So I think an important point that Steve made is that one of the uh, you know, one of the concerns is if some people are elected on a regional list and some people are elected in the first past the post seats, is there a status difference? And I know for myself of sitting for five months and watching the Electoral Reform Committee, and they had people testifying from different countries that use MMP, like New Zealand, Scotland, Wales. In most countries, it's kind of like Joanna and Steve said, um, they all do constituency work because, well, first of all, they all want to be elected in a constituency seat the next time. And second of all, they all, like Steve has said before, they all live somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's in their interest to connect with local people who will want to vote for them, whether that's in a local seat or on a list seat. So with either system, there's, in Canada, there's going to be a strong constituency link with all the MPs. We're not going to lose that. Um, okay, I want to just... I'm just going to open up my little, undock my little question pane here. Okay. Um, okay. So somebody wants to know um, why we can't have 10 second advertisements on TV explaining to people what's wrong with the voting system <laughs> because most people in Canada don't know. Um, and um, somebody else wants to know what the last election results in Canada would have been with proportional representation. So I can speak to the TV thing. So the reason why we don't have ads on television is money. So you can go to fairvote.ca slash donate and help change that. But just... <laughs> But just to put it in perspective, in December, um, when Minister Monsef refused to ask a straightforward question on proportional representation in that mydemocracy.ca survey, our supporters um, raised together $25,000 to run a page ad in the Toronto Star. And that's an ad in a newspaper. So to have advertisements on television, you need a lot of money, which is why we need government leadership on this. It's the government that has the money to educate people about voting reform if they care to do so, which is obviously back to the round the same circle of the problem that we had. Um, in terms of the last election, how would the seats have been different? Well, you just need to look at the popular vote. The Liberals got 39%. If we had a proportional system, they would have approximately 39% of the seats and they would have to either have a minority government with an agreement with another party, a coalition government, um, something of that nature. Uh, but you can just look at that on Wikipedia and see how that would have played out. But you can also know that with proportional systems, people vote differently. So you've heard that from both of the guests, right? So right now, for example, the, you know, the Green Party vote was like 3.8%. So uh, if it was a 5% threshold, in theory, the Greens might have just won like Elizabeth May's seat. But in reality, that Green vote obviously is going to go up because people know that they have a chance of electing somebody, whether it's on a regional list with MMP or on a local constituency uh, with STV. Um, one, another question uh, that's come up in discussions is 
if you're a small party, and maybe Joanna can speak to this, and I think Steve can speak to this too. If you're a small party, what's the advantage of being in a coalition versus outside of the coalition? And we're looking at this right now in BC. For those of you that know the Green Part, Andrew Weaver's Green Party with three seats is considering what kind of deal he wants to make with one of the other parties. Is it better to be part of a coalition government? Is it better to be on the outside where you're freer to criticize? Um, and what's the advantage in terms of seeing your policies enacted? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, being in government, like that's why people get involved in a political party because, you know, if the idea is that you would be in government and you would implement your ideas, you know, so um, I think at the same time, I don't think it would be good, you know, if we tend to change our government. So like, I think for a political party, um, you're always working to the future, I suppose. So even when you're in opposition, you're working to try and get into government, you know. Um, I suppose it's hard to imagine what it would be otherwise, you know, if you if you were in a system where you kind of knew you'd never be in government, you know, if you were to see the future how you might feel about it but I certainly know that when we're in government or when we're in opposition we tend to be kind of on the up right and we're working towards the future and a lot of uh, kind of uh, motivation around that and then when you're in government um, you're achieving things the problem I suppose for a party like the Labour Party is that we get cast out kind of the next election that's always been the case like you know so um I mean, I, I think being in government probably is better, but on the other hand, for the party, there's a consequence, you know, when it comes to being a smaller party, that you, it's very likely that being in government will make you popular because if you're smaller, you won't be able to achieve as much of your ideals, I suppose, you know. So um, it's, it's both, it's kind of a double edged sword being in government in the sense that you, know, you can achieve a lot, but on the other hand, can't achieve everything and your electorate is quite likely to finish it. Well, Steve? certainly, yeah, certainly the New Zealand experience, uh, that very first MMP election where New Zealand first and Winston Peters, its leader, went into a coalition with the National Party. Um, one, there's a lot of their voters weren't happy with that. They expected them to support Labour. But uh, after that, beyond that, uh, a bit like the Liberal Democrat Party in the UK when they allied with the Tories, if you're in a coalition, uh, the way they interpret this is um, you get ministers in cabinet and you're part of the executive. Um, you're then bound by uh, cabinet uh, solidarity, uh, and that means that um, you don't criticize. Uh, now, they've tried to uh, in, and and that, well, that was a problem for the small parties. If, they, if they're um, having to quietly go along with a bunch of things that they don't actually support, their voters feel that they're not being properly represented and that their interests aren't being actively um, pushed. And it's not visible that they may well be happening behind closed doors, but it's at the end of the day, it's not effective because the other policies are being implemented. So that is, I think, the primary danger for small parties, and that is the price they pay. Uh, and uh, the record on this is pretty certain that if you go into coalition and the government isn't very popular, um, you're screwed uh, and you're, that's it. You've had your shot. I hope you enjoyed it. Come back in three or four more years. Uh, and whereas what the New Zealand, what the Green Party has done in New Zealand has, has avoided that uh, by never going into a coalition. Uh, and uh, although in a way uh, there are other sharper elbows kept them out anyway, uh, but those sharper elbows paid their price and the Green Party is still there. And and I think that maybe the Greens in British Columbia might be looking at the experience of the Greens in New Zealand uh, and thinking about winning key policy concessions, uh, which advance their platform while not being in the government and being able to criticize anything and everything. And the only thing that's expected of them in the deal is that they vote for confidence and supply, which will keep the government from falling in a financial situation. Um, or a confidence situation. And I, I think that for a smaller party, uh, unless you are a really big small party uh, with a very solid constituency of your own that is not at risk of being pilfered or leaking away, uh, you're absolutely best to go in a minority uh, arrangement with support rather than go coalition because uh, 
you risk swallowing so many dead rats, you choke to death, and your voters don't like you. And I, I, that would be my observation on that. And I fully expect that after the next election here in September, on September 23rd, if the Greens do go into coalition, it will be because, uh, with Labour, it will be because the Green support has been steadily growing over the last 20 years, and it's now in the mid-teens, and that it's proven to be quite reliable over time, and the, their Green voters are tolerant of ups and downs. And uh, I would think that if they did go into coalition, they'd be making the calculation that the Greens have their own natural constituency now, and it is not significantly at risk, or at least totally at risk anyway, they'll always get the 5%. On that basis, they may well make the calculation it was worth the risk. But uh, for the first two or three MMP elections where the Greens were only getting 5 6 or 7%, um, there was no way they could have made that calculation. They would be, they could well be out on some of the policies that they might well have had to support and their voters did not. Because Green voters are a pretty grumpy lot. Uh, that's why they're, that's why they march to a different drum anyway. So, <laughs> so they won't thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I think just to kind of boil down what, uh, what people are saying is, you know, I, you saw the slide I put up where the Labour Party uh, went into a coalition, and as a result, they got a lot of their policies passed. Now, the next election, this last election, uh, voters were very angry with the government, and that would be in the major, mostly because of the big party. And so they got turfed out on their butt. So it, it can go through cycles, right? So they could have chosen to stay out of that coalition. Maybe they wouldn't have got so many of their policies passed. Maybe that made social change, um, important policies. Uh, but they paid a price for being a part of a government that became unpopular. So, you know, um, the same thing happened in Ireland with the Greens. They went into a coalition uh, with the, one of the big parties, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, next election, wiped out but they're back so they've you know they're resurging and they come back and um, one of the interesting things about the greens in ireland is nationally they only got 2.7 percent of the vote so if you had a list system they wouldn't have got any seats uh, but because they have prstv they won two uh two constituency seats in the multi-member ridings so you know there's advantages and disadvantages Two different systems. Um, let me just see if there's we've got time for maybe one more question. Let me just look. Okay, so somebody actually was asking a good question. Uh, what are the best? What's your advice uh, to for educating Canadians on PR? And what's the difference between this person asked? What's the difference between trying to do the educational work and trying to do campaigning for PR? Like what? What advice do you have for Canadians who want to see proportional representation in Canada? <laughs> I know. Keep keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're doing you're doing a great job. It's just uh, getting the message out there. And uh, I guess I mean, from on uh, being from Ontario originally, I, I know that um, it can be very hard to get people's attention, and especially about anything that's different um, and especially if you're outside Toronto I do remember when I worked on the MMP referendum in Ontario in 2007 um, it was easy to get the message across in Toronto and Owen Sound and the rest of Ontario was kind of a dead flat space and there were entire ridings where we had absolutely not even a committee because although there might have been 50 or 60 thousand people in the riding there wasn't a single individual who was sufficiently aware and motivated to do anything um, and that I think is the challenge you face across a lot lot of Canada is that a lot of years of media, the media loves to promote itself by bashing politicians and that has created an atmosphere where politics is negative and bad and anyone who engages in it is probably somehow vaguely disturbed uh, and, uh, and that makes it very very hard to talk about anything political with Canadians because they've been inoculated against politics uh, to a considerable extent and I've got people in my own family in Canada if, if the topic anything remotely political comes up, they'll be quite pointed and rude with you and tell you we don't talk about that. And, and that I, is a real, that's a Canadian social thing. And, and the, I don't know how you get over that. Um, um, maybe they all have to die first. It might take that long. I don't know. But, but uh, that, 
it, it really it, it, the key is just that that thing about how do you message to people who don't want to be messaged to and i don't know that everyone's cracked that nut yet we're still working on it i i mean i agree with steve because it's, it's actually similar here i think there's a lot of that going on here and i, I mean i think the media plays a big role in it as well like i mean you were saying about when um a small parties in a coalition government how they have to um you know they have to keep cabinet uh, solidarity and confidentiality so even though they might be fighting hard behind the scenes that's not coming out in the media but on the other hand the media is constantly trying to uh, you know to find um tension and conflict you know because and then, then it'll be the front page news and they even contrive it or kind of try and set up uh, one party against the other by winging up one and saying well the other party's saying this what do you say so like the, the media plays a big role i think in kind of I feel in making uh, the public point uh, cynical about politics. Um, but that being said, I think I think I would say that you know I would say that the way things are progressing in general probably is towards more democratic systems. And um, certainly, I, I remember it being said at the constitutional convention we had here, here in Ireland that the move generally was to systems more like basically more proportional um, systems, you know, with multi-seat constituencies and so on. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, keeping moving in that direction, keeping uh, publicising it. And I think educating young people, I think, about it, um, you know, would be important as well. Um. Um, so somebody is asking an opinion about referendums and whether they are the best way to go uh, for choosing whether or not to adopt proportional representation. So I think it's a little, the Canadian context, I mean we've had five referendums here now and we won two of them and we still don't have PR. So I mean maybe Steve can reflect on what was the difference, Steve, between trying to campaign for MMP here in Ontario and doing it in New Zealand? I, I, I've tried to work out what that is and, and I completely unscientifically, um, I have a gut feeling that it's got something to do with television. Uh, when, we were, when we were campaigning uh, for MMP in New Zealand, um, television here was not quite 20 years old and there was still a broad mass of people who grew up in a time when you still had to read and talk to people and uh, be part of local networks and communities and know who your neighbors were and 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 that kind of thing that that's those social engines still largely work um, Canada has had television since the 1950s or the early 60s and I found in Ontario uh, my own mother. I could tell her something, and uh, if Anderson Cooper didn't say it on CNN, then it's not true. And uh, it wouldn't matter that I said it, you know. And and I think a lot of people they don't realize that that's actually how they're consuming their information. Um, they have what they see as um, authorities, uh, and the authorities tend to be media voices. Um, and uh, they they will disregard uh, information presented by their own families and friends sometimes in favor of these authorities. So um, when it comes to referendums, uh, they were a useful tool in New Zealand in the um, early 90s, uh, and, uh, and I, I, I was strongly in favor of certain referendums. Uh, but one of the things that was also introduced here, which we haven't talked about, was a citizens initiated referenda policy. Um, they're non-binding, and so far most of the issues have been completely asinine, uh, and and I and 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 they all pass with a thumping majority, and governments uh, dismiss them and ignore them because the vast majority of them are just an expression of bigotry by a lot of people, uh, or lack of thought, or or, or it's a it's a failure of another IQ test by the New Zealand population. So my my evolution on referenda has become. Uh, I've gone to the point where I don't want to borrow the things um, <laughs> unless unless it's something that is so benign that no one's going to get hurt. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of referenda are by people with agendas that do hurt. 
So in terms of what's going on in Canada, the failure of the tool, the setting of that threshold at 60%, otherwise, I mean, a government can run the place with 39%, but we need 60% to change the voting system. I mean, that just was bizarre to me from the start. And it's proven to be utterly bizarre as time's gone on, because uh, as you say, uh, British Columbia had 57%. He has much support for MMP in a second referendum here, uh, and yet they still couldn't get STV. And uh, that, I mean, to me, that's, uh, that's terrible. It's a disgrace. So I can understand absolutely people saying, let's not have referenda because all that happens is the big money interests um, buy the result and, uh, and what people actually want and, and whether or not people informed is very much secondary and it's ineffective. And I, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Yeah, I'm over it. So I wanted to comment a little bit before Joanna puts it in um, context of Ireland is I don't think in Ireland they can change the voting system without a referendum. So they don't have the option that we do to have a process like we've had 14 of now and have politicians take leadership and implement something with a majority vote in the House. I don't think they have that option. It's worth noting that yeah. STV has um, survived two referendums in Ireland already. And like uh, Joanna said, they recently had a citizens assembly where they, again, they chose to keep STV and recommend making improvements on it. But you may have some comments, Joanna, on the usefulness of referendums for political issues like this in general. Yeah, I mean, I think what Steve said is true that, like, with referendums, you know, in principle, it's a good idea. But on the other hand, so like, you know, yeah, Brexit would be an example. If you, if you, you know, like say David Cameron allowed there to be a referendum on Brexit and it didn't go the way he hoped, you know, so like, backfire in that sense. And if you know. Um, I think Steve's concern about that is true, and I think there's been similar things happening in other countries on a minor or more minor scale, like where things have been voted for that would be considered maybe populist or whatever, you know, or dangerous even, you know. So, but I, I think in Ireland, because it ha you have to have a re referendum because we would be amending our constitution, I think it does bring in a conservatism in relation to that people want to protect the constitution. There's an idea that constitution is a good thing so like you know more often than not a referendum will um you know certainly the voters will be cautious you know but you know we don't get um in except now the marriage equality there was a very much a big majority in favor but um you know so we have huge amount of debate about issues of referendums and i think voters make a very informed decision you know so um i suppose I, I suppose what I would think about if you don't need to have it, um, should you know should you have one? Um, and I suppose when it comes to the electoral system, there probably is a strong argument in favour of having a referendum for changing the votes the voting system. You know because you know it's coming from the voters who will vote within that system, who use the current system. Um, so I, I would think you know a referendum is a good idea. You know despite all you know other reservations about. Uh, referendums in general you know. so one of the things that Steve said and it went by kind of quickly and so but I want everybody to take note of this when they had the two referendums in New Zealand the time between the first one when people voted yes to PR and the second one was five elections for 15 years so what Steve was saying is you know if you were 35 or younger and that confirmation referendum came up PR had become the status quo. You would never have voted with a first past the post system. And so the status quo in a referendum, uh, the conservative kind of point of view, like Joanna said, tends to have a built-in advantage. And that's what we heard for sure from the experts at the ERE, who 70% of them said a referendum on this issue is not probably gonna reflect what people, um, what people actually want when you bring in other factors like the media and the leadership and that kind of thing. So yeah, there's different different ways to look at it. So we had three parties in 2015 who campaigned on changing the voting system without a referendum. Unfortunately, they're failing to deliver on that, which leads me to the last question here. Somebody wants to know about the Electoral Reform Committee vote on Wednesday. 
Um, they want to know if I know how it's going to go. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> what I would say is, uh, so the vote is to concur in the report of the Electoral Reform Committee. So it's a in what it's the opposition, the NDP, using a routine motion to basically give Liberal MP backbench MPs an opportunity to say we want to talk about this some more. We don't agree with the Prime Minister unilaterally deciding that electoral reform is off the table. Uh, we want to open up a conversation about electoral reform again. So because all the other parties are going to vote yes to this, in part because um, there is a referendum recommended in it, all we need is 20 Liberals to vote yes for this motion to pass. And if this motion passes, it doesn't mean we're getting PR. I hate to burst anybody's bubble. It's concurring in a committee report. What it does is it sends a strong message to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet that enough of their Liberal MPs are unhappy about the way this whole thing is handled, that maybe they should consider um, talking about this again because this issue has more traction than they think. So I would highly encourage everyone to call their MP. Emails are great, um, but I mean, what we've been told by assistants about emails is they just count the number of emails they get. They may not even read your heartfelt appeal. They may look at the subject line and say, oh yeah, that's another one for that tick. So I would say call the office and make your views known and encourage your Liberal MP to vote yes uh, to, to the Electoral Reform Committee report on Wednesday. It's symbolic, but it's an important symbol. Um, and if you're in BC, you can sign our open letter to NDP leader John Horgan and Green Party leader Andrew Weaver asking them to form a stable government uh, with a you know a three or a four year term that that it will take to implement PR and again um, Joanne and Steve they're struggling with the same issue of whether do we need a referendum if so do we have to have it first could we have it later um, they're struggling with all these issues but a stable government that lasts long enough to design a system and implement it is really the key and that's what our open letter from Fair Vote Canada and Fair Voting BC is asking for. So I wanted to thank everybody who joined us today. I uh, really, really appreciate you taking your time. All the attendees, uh, Steve from New Zealand, Joanna from Ireland, I hope this has been informative. Um, if you have more questions on MMP, how it, would work, how it works in New Zealand, how it would work here, STV, how it would work here, how it works in Ireland, um, please do get in touch with me. I'm happy to put you in touch with either of our guests and hopefully we'll start doing these webinars again more often. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, have a good day. Nice to meet you, Joanna. Same Leslie, I'm Anita. Thank you.